All right, well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you for coming um, to talk about generative AI and what it means for our kids. So uh, Doug Schmidt is, is going to be talking with me tonight. So Doug is Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of uh, Computer Science at Vanderbilt, and he has also been nominated by the White House to be the uh, Director of Operational Test and Evaluation, um, so in the head in the Pentagon of uh, making sure everything works properly, including AI. And so Doug has a, a high schooler at USN, and Doug also does a lot of teaching with generative AI, and he's going to talk about that aspect. Um, I'm Jules White. I'm a professor in computer science, and I'm the director of Vanderbilt's Initiative on the Future of Learning in Generative AI. And then I'm the senior advisor to the chancellor on Generative AI and, and Enterprise. So I do a lot of work on thinking about how do we teach people about Generative AI and understand the impact that it's going to have, and how do we take advantage of it. Um, and so I'll be talking first from the perspective of thinking about, like, why is this technology so important and so transformative? And then Doug will be focusing more on the educational aspects of, you know, how he's using it in the classroom, how it changes what he does. And then we're going to leave a lot of time, 30 minutes or more at the end, for just discussion and Q&A and whatever questions you have. And happy to talk about it. I also have a fourth grader at USN. And... Um, one of the kind of fun things is that he's been doing a lot of generative AI stuff with me, and he has a blast with it, and I'll talk a little bit about that maybe later. So um, part of the reason I'm so excited about uh, generative AI is that in November 1st of 2023, or 2022, now I'm like losing track of when it came out, if you had stopped me on the street and you had said, this thing called ChatGPT is going to come out in a month, and here's what it's going to be able to do, I would have told you as a computer science professor, that's nice, but it's not going to exist in my lifetime. I don't believe it will exist while I'm alive. I will not see something of that capability. And then a month later, it came out. And to me, when I started looking at it, it was the most fundamentally important advance in computing of my lifetime. And I look, and in the news, what we're talking about is students cheating and Terminator. And I'm like, how can we take the most important advance that I've ever seen, maybe the most important advance of of humankind that I've seen in terms of technology and start talking about it in the wrong way. And what's, what's being missed? So I'm really passionate about thinking about it. What can we do with it? How do we solve problems with it? And trying to explain that. So as part of that, I created a Coursera course. It's an open online course um, on thinking through how to solve problems with generative AI and, and trying to teach people how to use it effectively. Um, this course has been very popular. The original course has about 230,000 people in it. Um, about another 70,000 are in the other courses. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is what I've heard from industry coming back, from people talking about how they're going to use it in investment banking, how they're going to use it in medicine, how they're going to use it in law. And so a lot of that is what you're going to see, is like what I'm hearing about the impact that it's going to have. So to give you a little bit of a uh, picture, I think it's helpful to start with some terms and also just a mental picture of what generative AI is. So, I like to think of generative AI, it's like text message. So you can go in and you can type in a text message to your friend, and you can send it off to your friend, and your friend can text you back a response. Or your friend can decide in response to take a picture of something and text you back the picture. Or they can record a video and text you back a video. And generative AI is exactly the same thing, except you type in a text message and you send it off to AI, and AI responds. And AI can send you back text, it can send you back images, now it can send you back video, all kinds of things. And the big difference is, is that in, in, in the terminology we use, that message that you type in to send off to your AI partner is a prompt. And the output is what is the message that they send back, or the response is the message you send back. Now, these are all examples of prompts you could send to generative AI. Write a poem about the French Revolution. If you had the right type of human friend, they could respond to that. You know, create a Pokemon game for my child. You have the right type of human friend, they could respond for that, to that. Generative AI is like the friend that no matter what you send them, they will respond. And that's both good and bad. So it's bad when you don't understand that. It's one of the fundamental amazing things about this technology that it can respond no matter what. Um, and so we'll take some, a, a look at some of those examples. Now, to really be effective with this 
technology, you have to start thinking about solving problems and using computing in a totally different way than we have before, and a really different way than you see in the news. So in the news, for the longest time, thank goodness we've gotten past some of this, you would see people say, I asked ChatGPT this question, and it gave me this really dumb or flawed answer. Therefore, ChatGPT is useless. And this is the wrong way of thinking about it. You don't want to think about it as a one-off, where you ask it a question and you get an answer. Or you tell it to do something and you get something that's either perfect or complete garbage. You need to think about using it as a tool that you refine content or you begin solving problems through a conversation. And a conversation is a back and forth. Kind of like if you had an intern and you were like, go do this, and they went off and they did it incorrectly the first time, you wouldn't say you're fired, don't ever come back. You would have a conversation about how to improve and how to you know, refine and iterate on what they were doing. And you have to use these tools exactly the same way. You have to think about iteratively through a conversation solving a problem. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, and I'm going to start off with something that's relatively easy. It's relatively easy, but I don't think there's a human being in Nashville that can do it as fast or as well as ChatGPT. So I'm going to say, please create a meal plan for my family that is based on a fusion of food from Ethiopia and Uzbekistan. I want to eat keto and up to 2,000 calories per day. Pick dishes where the ingredients are easy to get from an average U.S. grocery store. Maybe somebody in this room can do this. I haven't met anybody that can do it yet. Um, so what does ChatGPT say back in February of 23? And we've advanced significantly since then. Here's a sample meal plan that combines the flavors from Ethiopia and Uzbekistan, while also being keto-friendly within a 2,000 calorie per day limit. Breakfast, scrambled eggs with sauteed onions, tomatoes, and Ethiopian Berber spice mix. And then notice what it does. In parentheses, it says, made with chili powder, paprika, garlic powder, ginger, cumin, and coriander. And it's signaling these are ingredients that you can get at an average U.S. grocery store. Now, to put this in perspective, there's absolutely nothing that we had in computing before this came out that could get anywhere close to understanding average U.S. grocery store, much less put together something that's even remotely close to cuisine from those areas, and 2,000 calories and keto. Nothing could even remotely approach this. And Anybody can log in and do this. Now, if this was the news, it's changed a little bit. But a lot of people, you'll talk to them and they'll say, you know, you said uh, 2,000 calories, but it doesn't even have serving size. How can you possibly trust this output? This thing is, you know, completely useless in meal planning. It's not my perspective, but, you know, they say it's totally flawed. Look, it's got it all wrong. And if you really care about the serving sizes, you just follow up in the conversation and begin refining its output. And you just say, can you give me approximate serving size for myself for each dish within the 2,000 calorie limit? And it says, sure, two eggs, half a cup of onions, half a cup of tomatoes, one teaspoon of Berbera spice mix. And we're beginning to refine what it's doing. Now, a lot of people look at this tool as like a one-off. You ask a question and get an answer. It's a tool that you go and refine and build over an iterate, iterative process. Kind of like, I say it's like if you, somebody handed Michelangelo a hammer and he walked up to a, a stone and he hit the stone, he's not gonna look at the stone and be like, oh, it doesn't look like the Pieta and throw the hammer down on the, on the ground and say it's a terrible tool. No, he's gonna take the hammer and he's gonna iterate and refine and chip away at the stone. And he's also gonna understand that his skill with the tool is equally important. It's not just the tool itself. So you have to develop your own skill with the tool, but you also have to iterate and refine. Now, if we really wanted to go down the rabbit hole of macronutrients, for example, somebody might criticize half a cup of onions and say, that's not keto. Nobody's going to eat half a cup of onions if they're keto. That's too many carbs. And we could keep refining that aspect of it if we cared about it. But I'm going to take it in a different direction. So. I thought about, you know, if I was going to implement this meal plan at home, serving sizes, uh, serving sizes, macronutrients, that is not my problem. My problem is that I have, he was nine at the time that I first did these slides. He's 10 now. He's at a birthday. I have a nine-year-old, and he's going to look at this dish, and he's going to be like, there's no way I'm trying that. And so I thought, well, can I get ChatGBT to help me get him to eat it? And so I thought, Let's see what it can do. 
So I said, my son is nine. Sometimes he won't try new dishes. To make this culinary adventure more fun for him, can you create a short Pokemon battle story to go with each dish? I'll read the stories with him before dinner to get him excited about trying the new food. Make sure the story ends with a cliffhanger that will motivate him to try the food. Now I challenge you to find the person who can do the original meal plan. Now I really challenge you to find the person who can follow up with the Pokemon battle stories to motivate the nine-year-old to try the dish. And what does ChatGPT say? Story. Pikachu and his friends were exploring the wilds of Ethiopia when they were suddenly ambushed by a group of sneaky Pokemon thieves. As they raced through the dense jungle, they stumbled upon a hidden cave filled with treasure. And then it goes on to say, in the end, they emerged victorious, but not before the dragon left a fiery spice that imbued their breakfast eggs with a flavorful kick. Can you help Pikachu and his friends defeat the Berbere dragon and enjoy the spicy breakfast? Absolutely nothing that we had in computing could understand the concept of motivate a nine-year-old to eat a breakfast dish related and weave in Pokemon and do all this other stuff. That's a fundamental advance in computing that we had nothing that could do something like that. Now, people argue, does it really understand or reason? And so I say, okay, that's fine. Let's say it doesn't reason about it, but it computes something that produces that. And we could not do that computation before this tool exists. There was no computer on the planet that could do that. That's a fundamentally new thing. And I thought about, what else do we do with my son at the dinner table? And I thought, well, we like to talk with him about what he's learning here at USN. And he loves math, and he loves to play math games on the iPad. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I could get it to play a math game with him? Can I get ChatGPT to play a math game with him? So I say, I'd like you to play a math game with my nine-year-old to teach him about division with fractions and nutrition. Ask him questions one at a time involving Pokemon and these topics and make it into a game. When he wins, the Pokemon win. Ask the first question. And this is beginning to use some techniques called prompt engineering, which is just basically knowing how to structure your conversation in order to solve problems and get th certain things to happen. And what does it say? Great, let's play a fun math game. Question one. Pikachu and his friends are planning a meal that includes half a cup of cooked rice, but they need to divide it evenly among three Pokemon. How much rice will each Pokemon get? And then what does it do? It waits. Because it understands the concept of a game and turn-taking, or it computes it, or whatever you want to call it. I call it understanding. And it knows that it's its turn in the game to wait for his answer. And when he puts in one-sixth, it says, good job, that's correct works out the math for him, and then it goes on to the next question. Ash wants to make a smoothie. And in just a paragraph of text, I created a completely personalized educational game for my son that will go back and forth and just generate questions for him um, over and over um, and just keep asking him. And he escaped, luckily, to BMX practice before I did it. But I was like, hey, buddy, you have that quiz coming up on state capitals, let's go chat GPT it. And he's like, dad, I'm off to practice. And so he was gone. But there was, I, like as a computer scientist, if I tried to code that and write software to do that, it would take me forever. You can create a personalized educational experience along with all the content around Pokemon and fraction and nutrition simply by going in and saying, here's what I want you to do. That's a fundamentally game-changing computing capability. And then as a computer scientist, I thought, well, can I turn this into actual code that I could run? So it's nice that we can play an I, you know, a game within ChatGPT, but can I actually turn it into real working software that I could put on an iPad? And so I used some of my knowledge, and I said, let's create code for it in Python, which is a programming language. And it goes and generates, and this is a snippet of it, and then this is the game running in a browser that he could play on an iPad, he could play on a, a laptop. And all I did to get there was a series of basically paragraphs of text sentences. Absolutely nothing that we had in computing had that level of flexibility in terms of going through and starting from this crazy meal plan, moving into refining it with serving sizes, building the Pokemon battle stories to motivate the nine-year-old, and then we end up at working software at the end. And this is just sort of stream of consciousness, exploration, and creativity in a conversation. And that's a completely new type of tool that we have. Now, I'm going to give you some examples in business. Um, I'm going to start off with the Vanderbilt travel and business expense policy. 
I was happy because I always, I always, in the beginning of these talks, I say, you know, I've had many expenses rejected because of this policy, but I've never actually read it. And then I had multiple people at the table with me today saying, I'm always getting my business expense uh, rejected. I thought, well, man, I've got the demo for you. Um, now, it turns out I have read it through ChatGPT. So I uploaded the travel and business expense policy. It's about 17 pages of PDF. And I said, please read the provided document so you can answer questions about it. And then I asked it a question that looks like what I actually ask people, which is, let's assume I'm in a foreign country traveling in a taxi and it breaks down on the way to an important meeting. Can I get reimbursed if I pay someone to drive me on the back of their motorcycle to the meeting? What does ChatGPT say? Based on the information provided in the document. So that's the first important thing it says, which is, I am using your information. People think of it as like it trained, it, that's all it has access to, or it has access to the internet. It doesn't have access to your stuff. You can give it whatever you want to compute with. Kind of like your CPU in the laptop, you can give it whatever information you want to calculate things. Well, you can use it as sort of a general purpose computing engine. So I'm giving it the information. It says the university requires travelers to select the most reasonable and economical form of transportation. That's a direct statement out of the document. Non-conventional transportation options are not explicitly mentioned. That is true. And Vanderbilt does not have a separate policy on ride sharing. That is also a direct statement out of that document. And you notice it's translating riding on the back of a motorcycle into non-conventional transportation and finding the phrase where Vanderbilt says we don't have a separate policy on ride sharing. And then at the end it says given these points, it seems plausible that in an emergency situation where no other reasonable and economical form of transportation is available, the cost of transportation by a private citizen's motorcycle might be considered an allowable expense. However, the university's policy does not explicitly state this and reimbursement may be subject to review. It's an excellent answer that would come from Vanderbilt. We might reimburse it and we will review it. Now, it's one thing to answer questions and quote from a document. You know, we've kind of had things like that. It looks a lot like internet search to some degree. It's a little more sophisticated than that. But does it really understand the content of the policy? So I uploaded a rental car receipt, and I say, please analyze the attached receipt and let me know if it complies. And it comes back, and it has this, I'm gonna highlight this area down here, collision damage waiver. For domestic travel, the CDW should be declined as rental vehicles are fully insured through Vanderbilt's insurance portfolio, the receipt shows a charge for CDW, which may not comply if this is domestic travel. So not only did it go and quote for us and interpret the policy, but it actually can understand it or compute with it, whatever you want to call it, well enough to take a receipt and begin applying the policy. Now, if I had, as a computer scientist, to go and write software to do this, this is like a team of people and probably years to get something of this level of sophistication. And all I had to do to get there was give it the document, the right instructions in just plain text, and then the receipt, and it could go and do this. This is the instructional enrollment report from Vanderbilt. It's put out by the registrar, and it's about 20 pages of these tables. And if I was a researcher and I wanted to do work with this before, I was probably cutting and pasting out of this uh, PDF into like Excel or something in order to then do some actual work with it. I can upload that into ChatGPT. There used to be a separate tool for this called Code Interpreter, and then they renamed it Advanced Data Analysis, and now it's just all ChatGPT. Um, I upload it, and I say, please extract each page of this PDF as plain text. And it goes and extracts each page, and I can go and download them. Now, we had tools that could do that before, but it starts to get more interesting when I say, turn it into Excel. And it takes it, and it interprets all the data and turns it into an Excel file that I can download. That would be extraordinarily difficult to write software to do that. You can do it, but it's really tough and to make it accurate. But the interesting thing is, I don't really need an Excel file anymore, because I can just say, display four interesting visualizations of the data directly inside of it, and it goes back and generates all the visualizations. Now notice what I didn't ask it for. I didn't tell it, what to visualize. I didn't tell it colors. I didn't tell it axes. I didn't tell it types of visualizations. 
anything like that. It just said, give me four interesting things. Now I could follow up and tell it everything I want, like I don't like these, they're not that great, and it would refine it. But I can simply start thinking about what do I want to, what questions do I want to ask? What do I want to know about this data? And spend my time thinking as opposed to spending all this time getting data into Excel and seeing if I can get it in the right format in order to maybe generate a couple charts. And when I was putting these visualizations together, I thought, well, if I was doing this, probably the real reason I'm doing this is because I'm going to give a presentation. And I really hate messing around in PowerPoint. So can it help me with that? So I uploaded my slide template and I tell it, Save each visualization as an image, then insert each of these images as separate slides into the attached PowerPoint. And then I give it some information on how I want it formatted, and I tell it to put a text box next to each image telling, it, um, telling what it is. And then this is the PowerPoint presentation that it created. My PowerPoint template, as you can see, it's got each uh, image as a separate slide. And then it's got a text box next to each one describing what it is. The heat map visualizes the correlation between different enrollment categories, which is all stuff that it generated. Now, in terms of like just basic productivity and our ability to do things with computing, that is really game changing. But if you think deeper about what's happening and you look under the covers, it's far more transformative than you realize. So I want you to imagine your shock, if you went into your backyard with a shovel, and right as you were about to dig a hole, your shovel jumped out of your hands because it saw a rock in the way, and your shovel builds itself a pickaxe. It uses its pickaxe to break up the rock, and then the shovel jumps back in your hands, and you keep digging. That would be a shocking moment for most people, and that's exactly what just happened. The tool itself built other tools and used them. So when I said to create that, uh, PowerPoint, for example, it had to save each of those images or save each of those visualizations as an image and then generate a PowerPoint presentation. And this little gray box popped up. The way this looks in ChatGPT is a little different now, but it's basically the same thing is happening behind the scenes. If you expand that box, the tool it built is software. So it wrote its own program on the fly because it said, look, I, don't, I can't save these as is images. I can't create a PowerPoint, but I can write software to do it. And it wrote the software. It executed the software. It looked at the results, determined if it was correct or not. Once it was correct, it then gave me a link to the PowerPoint presentation to download that it had created. So it can build its own tools. So we think about like people getting excited when gorillas go and put blades of grass into termite mounds to get you know termites out, and that's like tool building in the animal world. And we now have these AI tools that can do one of the most sophisticated tool building tasks on the planet, which is writing software. What I trained decades to do, it can do it. It's okay, I'm not worried about being replaced. So these new capabilities are gonna fundamentally transform what we can do in computing um, for many, many different ways. One, they're just wildly more powerful, but they also change the interface to computing. So what do we need to learn in order to tap into this? Well, unfortunately, this text box at the bottom gives people the impression that it's internet search. And it fundamentally is not internet search. You do not type in questions and get facts out. Now, there are ways to type in questions where you get things that can be facts out, but that's not what it was designed to do. At the same time, you can't type anything in and expect it to just work. There is a skill in understanding how to phrase and structure the problem and express it so that the tool will be able to work with it effectively. So to give you a little bit of intuition behind this, I'm going to talk about how these models were trained for one second. So basically, these models were taught to predict the next word in a sentence. So they would show it Mary had a little, and then they'd try to get it to predict lamb, and then they'd show it Mary had a little lamb, and they'd try to get it to predict its, and they'd show it Mary had a little lamb its, and they'd try to get it to predict fleece. And they did this over and over on huge chunks of the internet, books, you know, transcripts from movies and videos and all kinds of other things. And over time, it learns how the patterns on the left-hand side influence the words that should come out. And so when you put in a prompt, it's basically the left-hand side. And then in, when you see it sort of like typing in its output, it's because word by word, it's predicting what the next word in the output should be. How on earth this leads to this incredible reasoning 
capabilities or computing or whatever you want to call it. It's not really known, but it's uh, unbelievable. So part of what our research at Vanderbilt is, is looking at patterns in the language and how you kind of understand these patterns, what types of problems you can use that sort of pattern in language to solve, and then how to teach those, teach those sort of patterns as building blocks to people to solve problems. Now, patterns sound crazy, but we use them every day. So if you write a formal letter, you say, dear so-and-so, comma. And the dear has a purpose to indicate respect. You have the person's name to show who it's addressed to, and you have the comma. That's a pattern that's just a basic thing that we use all the time. And there's lots of things like this that you can use to be really effective with these tools. So I'm going to show you one that's one of my favorites because it's so wildly different from anything we've ever had in computing. And it's called the persona pattern. So in the real world, there's lots of problems that we solve not by solving them ourselves, but by knowing who to go talk to to solve the problem. So if I have questions about nutrition, I'll go talk to a nutritionist. I don't know how they'll arrive at their answer. I don't know what they'll tell me, but I know I can solve the problem by getting to them. If I have a question about my taxes, I'll go talk to the IRS. I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know how they're going to arrive at it, but I know I can go to them to find the solution. And it turns out we can do the same things with these models. We can simply say, act as this persona. Act as a nutritionist. Act as the IRS. And it will completely change the reasoning and capability of these models and how it outputs things. So I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, this is one that's close to home. My wife is a speech therapist for Metro. And she tests kids typically when they're about three to determine if they need IEPs before going to kindergarten. So I'm going to say, act as a speech language pathologist. I'm going to tell you what a three-year-old said, and you will write an assessment for me. The child said, I need way boy. So I tried to think about what my son sounded like at three and capture this in text. So what does ChatGPT say with this persona of a speech language pathologist? Based on the provided speech sample, it appears that the child may be experiencing some phonological and articulation errors, which are common in children around this age. The child's utterance appears to have errors in consonant production and possibly some difficulty with syllable structure. Um, it seems that the child's having difficulty with the reduction of some consonant sounds, specifically the N and L sounds. The child said mead instead of need and woy instead of toy, assuming the intended words were need and toy. This indicates that the child may be experiencing difficulty with the production and differentiation of these consonant sounds. Syllable structure. The child's production of the word way may indicate some difficulty with the correct syllable structure. It's possible the child intended to say play but produced way instead which suggests a substitution of the initial consonant cluster PL with a single consonant W. Now notice, I didn't ask it for any of that. I simply said, act as a speech language pathologist, and it completely changed how it responded and reasoned to what I gave it. And so that idea of a persona becomes a fundamental building block where you can go and say things like, act as a chief information security officer and give me your perspective on this. Act as a skeptic, which is a fascinating one because investment banking Someone I talked to, they were saying, we've got to, we're going to set up our private version, and we're going to put all our deal documents in, and we're going to say, act as a skeptic, identify all of our assumptions, and challenge them. And they want to take their teams in and spend weekends prepping before they you know, put deals out to make sure that they've thought through it carefully. And what's interesting is everybody's talking about AI bias, but one of the things AI can do really well is help humans overcome their own biases to see different perspectives and ways of doing things just if you have the right approach, something like a persona. Now I'm going to wrap up quickly here with one last sort of interesting aspect of these things, which is we've spent a lot of time in the past training individual AI models to do really specialized tasks. And these models are completely different. These are like general purpose things that can just solve all kinds of problems that they were never taught to solve. Um, you can use it kind of like a CPU in a computer to process all kinds of things. Before, you had to go and train something to do this one specific task, and if you went off axis just a little bit, it just didn't work. And this is nowhere more true, I think, than in computer vision. And I'm going to show some examples with what ChatGPT and GPT-4 vision can do, which I think, by the way, in my opinion, is the most advanced computer vision on the planet. So the other night, I was at Super Rica in the Gulch with a friend. And he said he'd never uh, done anything with ChatGPT, and that was unfortunate for him, because then I wouldn't shut up for the rest of the dinner. 
So my first demo was I took a picture of the table and I said, who needs a refill? Now this is not an easy computer vision problem. And if I had to train AI to do this before, it would take a lot of work. Um, and ChatGPT just says, it looks like the glass with ice water is still fairly full while the beer bottle seems to be nearly empty. So someone might need a refill on beer soon. To build that with computer vision would have taken a vast amount of effort. And all I had to do was give it the image and the question and suddenly have a new tool. And then because I was blabbing on about ChatGPT, I hadn't paid attention to the menu. So I was like, I need help. I'm going to get ChatGPT to order for me. And so I snapped this picture of the menu and I said, I'm feeling indecisive and out of time. The waitress is here. Everyone is waiting on me. I need a quick keto option. It comes back with go for the grilled chili reno with smoked chicken and sliced avocado. It's keto friendly, well, low in carbs and high in fat and protein. And what's funny is the first time I looked at this, I was like, grilled chili reno. And I look over here and I'm like, chili reno, uh, crispy poblano with corn. Ha, it got it wrong. That's totally not keto at all if it's got corn. And then I went back and I was like, oh no, it's a grilled chili reno. And that's the next item down on the menu. And it's smoked chicken, sliced avocado and queso fresco. So it got it right. And then I was looking up and I was like, oh, that's an awesome light fixture. I wonder if we can figure out how to DIY build it at home. So I snapped a picture of it. And I said, give me a detailed step-by-step -step plan for creating a DIY version of this light fixture. Also give me a complete list of materials that I will need and identifiers 1A, 1B, and then reference them. Gave me a very long plan. So I'm just going to give you the step-by-step -step part. Had materials, everything up above. Take the metal wire 1A and start by shaping it into multiple circles of different diameters. Use the pliers 1B for more precision. Connect the circles together using smaller wire segments to create a similar 3D shape. And it goes on and on and on. So it understood what that thing was and could build a plan to create it. Now what's fun is this, this vision capability is really fun with kids, by the way. Because like I showed my son, I'm like, you're reading like Guinness Book of World Records go around and take pictures and ask what is the world record re related to what I just took a picture of. Or give me an interesting science fact about something I just took a picture of. And he'll run around and like take pictures and like do stuff. And then he also can go and create games in this where he'll say, okay, I want you to generate an image of, you know, um, X and then I'm going to have to guess it. And if I get it wrong, I lose the game. And you let you keep generating images until I guess wrong. And he can generate and create whole games for himself couple more quick examples and I'm going to hand off. Used to have to copy down whiteboards, simply snap a picture of it, and it translates it into text. And then I'm just going to wrap up with, I'm always trying to break it. Like, how far can I go? So I found this picture on Amazon of squirrel finger puppets. No way. No way. Forget it. I finally found something that will defeat it. How many squirrels were hurt in the making of this photo? it's likely that no squirrels were harmed. The image appears to show novelty or costume finger puppets designed to look like squirrels. Such products are typically made from materials like rubber or silicone. Fundamentally, absolutely nothing we had in computing could do something like that. Like the fluidity that I just went through all those images, all the tasks from building a light fixture to identifying squirrel finger puppets to at the very beginning creating the mill plan and playing a Pokemon game with my child, nothing that we had could do. So two things are happening. One it has fundamentally unique capabilities, like the persona. Um, but at the same time, it creates a new interface to computing, where instead of being stuck with a GUI and whatever buttons the programmer put there, you have this fluidity to go and do whatever you want, but without the expense of having to be a programmer and do all this work to program and code. So, what I think we should be talking about is not artificial intelligence to replace people, but augmented intelligence that amplifies and augments human creativity, critical thinking, and problem solving skills. It's like an exoskeleton for the mind that you put on, and then it allows you to solve bigger and harder problems than you would have before. Now, certainly you could do things quicker, but we've seen a lot of the quick results, and they're not the most exciting things, right? These kind of half outputs that aren't that great. But you put somebody together with real critical thinking and creativity, and you can take these dual tools and do wildly powerful things that are better than what you could have done otherwise, and probably faster. So I'll just leave with the things that I think are really exciting about this. 
using it to aid human coordination, looking at how are people communicating, what are mistakes that might be missed, cutting out tedious tasks, helping provide a safety net. I don't want it diagnosing me as a doctor, but if it wants to double check my chart and make sure something wasn't missed, I'm happy for that. Inspiring better problem solving and creativity, thinking about like brainstorming ideas, alternate solutions, rather than just jumping to, I know how to solve the problem this way, saying, what are five other ways? Let me think about it before I jump into it. And then enabling great ideas to scale faster by doing things that were fundamentally new, like the persona that I couldn't do before or act as a skeptic. So these are some of the um, papers that Doug and I have put together and written on this topic. And I'm gonna hand it off to Doug now. And uh, he's gonna talk about some of the educational aspects. So I'm Doug Schmidt, and I'm a professor at Vanderbilt in computer science like Jules. But both Jules and I have broad, diverse backgrounds. I actually have a bachelor's degree and master's degree in sociology, and Jules is an artist. And so one of the things that you do when you have that broad perspective is you look back to the classics for guidance on how to live your life. So as you recall, Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth, worth living. Shortly before he said, I drank what? So my paraphrase on this is the unrecorded talk is not worth giving. So we're recording everything here and we'll put that out in a video form later so you can go back and watch it. And uh, I tend to talk very fast so you can slow down the talk when you watch it again. So I'm gonna talk about how we're applying generative augmented intelligence, the AI plus stuff that Jules just talked about in the courses that we're doing at Vanderbilt. I'll be focusing particularly on computer science courses. And I have to start by putting a caveat. Not everybody at Vanderbilt is a, as much of a true believer as Jules and I are, but that's okay. Here's my perspective. Some, gosh, 60 years ago or so, in the shadow of nuclear war and fear of nuclear war, Stanley Kubrick created the classic movie called Dr. Strangelove with the tagline, how I stopped worrying and loved the bomb. So here we flash forward 60 years, it's 2024. I have a new phrase, how I stopped worrying and I learned to love the chatbot. Another thing to note, all my lectures from 2012 onwards at Vanderbilt are available on my YouTube channel. So you're welcome to watch that if you're having a trouble falling asleep. There are 3,000 plus videos. And as you can see, I have a lot of views and a lot of subscribers. This is probably the one thing my son is proud of about his dad. I have a large YouTube influence. This will actually figure into my talk later on. So it wasn't just put there randomly. So let's talk about some of the things that we do at Vanderbilt. So I teach a bunch of courses at Vanderbilt. I won't bore you with all the low level technical details unless you're really curious. So we're working on building parallel computing applications that use multi-core processors on mobile and cloud platforms in order, in order to do all kinds of interesting things. So for example, I'm teaching a course right now, this semester, where people are building a movie recommender app with both AI and non-AI parts. Movie recommendation systems are a great example of AI because they're going to figure out what you like to do. If you spend enough time on YouTube, it'll start to predict what things you like and it'll put those things in your feed. These are courses that are so-called mezzanine courses. All that means is that both undergrads, upper division undergrads, and grad students can take the courses. And that is significant here for most of my talk as a context because it allows us to avoid some of the thorny issues when we start trying to teach these things for our intro courses where people have a lot less background. And we'll come back to that because that's a very important thing, especially when you start thinking about the utility here at a place like USN where we want people to get some fundamental skills before we have them outsource their brains to a, an AI system. So as a teacher, there's some things I really, really, really like to do. I like to create and give lectures. I like to create and explain code examples. I like to make programming assignments. I like to do reviews of my students' code for the initial pass. Those are all fun things. There's some things that are really not things I like to do. I don't like to create tests and quizzes. I really hate to make knowledge check questions for my slides that say, what did you learn after the past 10 slides? I don't like to do the grading of my final assignments. And I hate to summarize the contents of my lectures in the description box in the videos because I can never remember what I just talked about for 45 minutes. So these are things I don't like to do. And a lot of what I'm about to talk about is how I can use AI and generative AI to take the stuff I don't like to do and focus on the stuff I do like to do. And that's exactly what Jules was just talking about when he was saying it gives us more time to be human. So some people think, oh, you know, we're going to be less human. My perspective after doing this for the last year is I'm much more excited, much more able to focus on the things that are really fun. So let's talk about some of the things that we're doing. So one thing we do, and this is 
partly a result of the pandemic, because we do a lot of online quizzes and so on. We used to do it in pen and paper before the pandemic. Pandemic happened, people weren't there to do things in pen and paper. And quite frankly, one of the great things about doing them in an electronic form is we don't have to try to read the sloppy handwriting of our students. It's very nice. So what I do, because we do everything online, one thing I do is I generate knowledge check questions from my presentations. So using the, the, the advanced data analysis tool that Jules was talking about, I can give it a PDF version of my lecture slides, and I can say, please read the attached file and generate multiple choice questions that are knowledge check questions based on what I just talked about in class. And then I can take those things and put them into my lectures so I can stop and ask questions and see if students are following along. Saves me a ton of time. I really hate to do that stuff. This makes it easy. Another great thing I can do, because I, I record all my videos in my class and I chop them up into little segments of about five to 10 minutes each, upload them to my YouTube channel for each of my classes. And then I use a tool, it's a Chrome browser extension called Glass. And when you get the PDF version of the slides, you can click on this, it'll take you to the Glass website, which enables me to take any given YouTube video, mine or anyone's, and if I click on this little tab, it will use ChatGPT. It'll take the transcript of the video, throw it into ChatGPT, provide a concise and informative summary of the video, and then I can sit there and ask it questions, and it can tell me what was in my video, in my transcript of, my, of what I just talked about. And of course, I use that to generate the transcripts that go in the description box for my video. So I can say, generate a 100-word summary of this video based on the transcript. Boom, something useful comes out. Of course, I edit it a little bit to make it sound like me, but it was me. It used me as the input, so of course it's going to sound a lot like me. It's tremendously useful. Another thing I do is I create quizzes and exams based on my class lecture videos. Now think about this for a second. I go to class, I talk for an hour and 15 minutes or however long it is. At the end of class, I usually think, what the heck did I just talk about? But I want to be able to make my quizzes based on what we talk about in class. Why do I want to do that? Because it motivates the students to show up and pay attention. And even if they don't show up and pay attention, they can watch the video, and then they can learn to study for the, the quizzes. And so here's an example where I take a video, I say generate a four item multiple choice question with multiple correct choices based on the transcript from the video, along with an explanation of the correct choices. This is the part that would go into the, the quiz. This is the part I give to my TAs and graders to evaluate stuff, just beautiful. The other really cool thing, and this is so powerful at any level in education, is students can leverage this with Glass and ChatGPT to have a 24-7, 365 or 366 day a year tutor to help them figure out what it was they learned in the class. That is ridiculously transformational and amazing. And if you want to find the take of Saul Khan, who's the founder and CEO of Khan Academy, he has a great video where he talks about how generative AI is going to be the salvation of education not the destruction of education. And I really believe his perspective, and he, they do some cool stuff with these types of tutors. Wow, think about people here at USN. My, my son is currently in AP US History, and they're gonna have the AP US History exam here in May. And some people go out and hire expensive tutors to get people up to speed. I'm like, why don't you use ChatGPT to act as the persona of a AP US History exam reviewer, and then just practice gooing sample answers as much as you want, and it doesn't cost me a dime, right? So great stuff. So those are some ways I'm using it for, for certain sets of things. Let me now change course and talk about something else that's very important. One of the ways that we evaluate things in computer science is people doing programming assignments. If you're in other disciplines, like here, English literature, my son loves English literature, they do essays and you grade the essays. Historically, those things took a lot of people time to do. So let's talk about some ways that we're using augmented intelligence to generate both solutions and grading assessments of programming assignments. Now, why is this relevant at all? Well, it turns out that, as Jules just pointed out, these AI tools are getting really good at doing things we used to think only people could do. So at the beginning of the fall semester, we had a faculty meeting, and one of my colleagues, Jerry, who teaches the introductory course in programming in our data structures course, he said, I've never used ChatGPT. And I said, oh, you really should use it because all your students are gonna start using it to get the solutions to your programming assignments generated without them having to think. And he said, no, 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 my assignments are really hard. I said, all right, well, let's see. So I said, Jerry, send me the PDF of your hardest programming assignment. So he sent me this thing, Project 6. 
So I said, watch this. So we sat down together at the faculty meeting during a break. I said, please read the given PDF file and generate a C++ program, it's a programming language, that implements this specification. So this was maybe six or seven pages worth of PDF with the programming assignment. And he sat there and we watched this thing generate page after page of output that had the solution. And we would look at each of the things that was generated. This is again what kind of what Jules was showing, how it generates code and does stuff under the hood. And I just watched his face get ashen. And when we're all done, I said, Jerry, isn't that great? What do you think? Because it was pretty much the perfect solution. He said, Doug, I think it may be time to retire. <laughs> so I thought smugly to myself, well, you know, you're teaching one of those intro courses. This couldn't possibly happen to me in my advanced course where I'm teaching really hard topics. But it was like the day before the first day of class in the fall. So I went back and said, well, let me just take a look and see. So I took my programming assignment that was going to go out the next day, and I ran it through ChatGPT. And I said, please generate the code from my specification. And boom, it did pretty much a perfect job in about 20 seconds. Suddenly, this was a problem, right? When it was Jerry's class, no problem. When it was my class, I'm like, oh, holy moly. So I started to think about how I could improve on how I describe my programming assignments to make it harder to just outsource people's brains to do the work for them. Now, the good news is ChatGPT taketh away, but ChatGPT also giveth channeling my inner Job. Blessed be the name of ChatGPT. So what I asked it, I said, hey, ChatGPT, how can I modify my programming assignment specifications so they're harder to reverse engineer with generative AI? And it gave me a bunch of really good explanations of how to do this, one of which, one of which said, basically, step back and give more high-level specs. Don't give people all the details. Help them, you know, give them a high-level view of what to do and let them fill in the rest. OK, great. The problem with doing that, however, is all of a sudden, I've created one set of problems, which was how do I make sure people don't cheat, with a different set of problems. How do I evaluate people's solutions? Because now it's much more open-ended what they can do. And it, I don't really have time to spend all day reviewing my programming assignments for my students by hand to try to find all the really interesting and creative ways of trying to solve the problem. Back in the day, like before this experience <laughs> shocked me to the core, we wrote a bunch of tests, without getting into the nitty gritty details again, called white box tests and mocking, where we could take the code that was written in a somewhat Procrustean bed-like specification, and we could analyze it quickly and automatically to see whether or not it conformed to what we expected. That's what we used to be able to do. However, this didn't work anymore because we give things more, more broad. The second way we historically have solved this problem is by arm, uh, hiring an army of graders and TAs to go through all the code and evaluate it by hand, which is a great way to get your grad students and undergrads some extra money, which is good. The downside is you quickly run into what's known as the inter-rater reliability problem. If you've ever watched uh, figure skating or women's gymnastics or whatever at the Olympics, you know the problem. The Russian judge gives it one score, the US judge gives it another, and so you have this problem of trying to be consistent. They're hard graders and easy graders. So we decided to come up with a way of turning lemons into lemonade by using generative AI to move away from these highly prescriptive specifications to ones that are more general, which is good, while still being able to grade them effectively. So what we use, which I'm going to talk about here, is how we use augmented intelligence to improve how we review and grade the assignments in my courses. And I'm just going to pick one example. I use this in all the classes. Now, I have a very unusual pedagogical style for my programming assignments, people have to submit the assignment initially. And this is actually the way that people do like English essays at USN, because my son tells me about this. You submit an initial draft, someone, the teacher, reads it, gives you feedback, then you iterate, you have to improve it. That may take a couple of different iterations. And then you turn in the final version, and then somebody grades it and gives you a final grade. So that's how things work in my computer science classes at Vanderbilt. And basically, this is something, if you think about it, called discrepancy analysis. You're looking for divergences from the right solution. Now, in English essays, there's probably no one right solution. In programming, there's often a closer, smaller number of right solutions. And you can't just do random things. Otherwise, your program won't compile and run. So let's talk about how we do this. So the first thing the students do is they submit their assignment. And then me, Doug Schmidt, reviews their assignment. And what I do, and I've done this for decades, is I go through everybody's solution, and I write down what I call the frequently made mistakes, because people tend to have common mistakes. And I put that in a file. 
and I make a video about this. Now, I've done this for a very long time, like probably 20 years. This is kind of cool, and students love it, but the problem historically was every time I taught the class, I was a little better at detecting the problems. However, I couldn't leverage this experience from previous semesters. I had to do it afresh every time, which became somewhat tedious and error prone. So what we did is we used ChatGPT to read this file containing all the mistakes, and it generates an automated grading rubric in a format using JavaScript object notation or JSON. That's not too important. It's just a stylized format, kind of like what Jules was talking about with putting things into an Excel spreadsheet form that says what the problem is, here's a correct example, and here's the incorrect example. So now we have a file that's machine readable that explains, abstracts away from the problems that I saw. And now what we're going to do is we're going to come up with an automated way using ChatGPT to help to augment the grading process so that my TAs and graders no longer have to read my mind to know how to evaluate the programs. I know what I'm looking for, but it's historically it's been hard to offload that into the brains of my TAs and graders, leaving aside the inter grader reliability problem. You know, there's the downloading your brain in absence of the Vulcan mind meld problem, which you also deal with. So what we did is we trained ChatGPT to analyze the final submissions the students have for the frequently made mistakes that we identified, and then it detects the places where there's discrepancies between what we were looking for and what the students actually did based on the, the training that we gave it with the frequently made mistakes information. And we wrote a paper about this, which recently got accepted at a workshop, so you can read the paper and learn more about what we're doing. Now, a couple things to note here. We use a private version of ChatGPT at Vanderbilt so we don't leak this stuff to the broader world so that the internet doesn't know, know the solutions to all my, my programming assignments. And there will still be a handful of places where there'll be so-called false positives, where the, the ChatGPT will say, your code is wrong when the code is, in fact, correct. So we'll, we'll mark down, you know, if you didn't do this with augmented intelligence, you might incorrectly mark someone down. There are two easy ways to solve this. Number one, the TAs and graders look at the output from ChatGPT, and then they go look at the code, because it's flagging the things that are said to be errors. And they can quickly tell if they're really errors or not. And they're not usually too many errors. The second way to solve the problem is when you give the grade back to the students, if there are any mistakes in the grading, you will quickly discover the mistakes, because your students will show up using the crowdsource uh, model and tell you where things are wrong. So this, this is a good example of using generative AI where there's very little consequence of being wrong. You're not wrong very much, but if you are wrong, it's caught through humans. That's the augmented intelligence part. So another cool thing about this is when ChatGPT doesn't detect a problem you know is in a student's code, then you can engage in Socratic dialogue with ChatGPT. You can say, your answer to the problem that was in the student's code was incorrect. How can you teach me how to use you more effectively through prompt engineering to make sure that henceforth you give the right answer the first time. And because ChatGPT is a, a smart little bugger, it'll tell you, oh, if you rephrase your question as blah, 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 then I'll be able to do a better job. That's really, really cool. In fact, good luck trying to do something like this with almost any other tool where you ask the tool to teach you how to use it better. So once again, paradigm shifting, transformational, gave me a chance to put Leonardo DiCaprio in a video slide, so that was fun. Uh, so really powerful technique. So the last thing I'm going to talk about here, and then we're going to open this up for Q&A, is how to apply ChatGPT to problem solve a task. Now this is something that's very interesting. Historically, when people came to computer science from biology or physics or classical civilization, and they said, how can we use computation to solve our domain problems? We would tell them, we're going to teach you how to program with JavaScript. We're going to teach you to program with Python. We're going to teach you to program with, God help us, uh, C or C++. The wrong thing. People don't want to become programmers. They want to use computation to do whatever they do in their professions or their research. And so this gets us into the topic of prompt engineering. Jules alluded to that. I'll, I'll give you another perspective on this in a second. So if you program stuff, you end up awash in a sea of spaghetti-laden complexity. But when you learn to think like a prompt engineer, 
suddenly you are freed from a lot of the accidental complexities of writing code, and you can focus more on the problem at hand. So I'm gonna give you an example that we did at our faculty retreat last year that demonstrated how this worked. And we're gonna do it by what we call natural language programming, which is the way of the future for a lot of people, especially people who don't wanna be computer scientists. So here are the steps that are involved. First, what we were trying to do, we wanted to have a faculty meeting, and we wanted to have all the faculty members in advance give us a one sentence description of what they wanted to get from this meeting. So we had about 35 faculty coming, each person gave us one uh, particular thing that they wanted to do, and that was the topic they wanted to discuss. Well, we can't have 35 separate discussions with the faculty, so we had to group them together. So what we did is we used ChatGPT to group the topics together. So we said, here's 35 things people care about. See if you can group them together into little topic areas and generate summaries of what the topic area will cover. So one set of topics had to do with academic and course programmatics. Another had to do with faculty and student development. Another had to do with making the department a more exciting and welcoming place, et cetera, et cetera. So we ended up with about five or six categories out of that. And then we took those five or six categories and we used Google, Google Forms, to get each faculty member to say what they were most interested in going to. So we said, give us your top three choices of the six different topic areas. Tell us what it is you want to do. And then here's where things got fun. If you were doing this the old-fashioned way, you would probably sit down with the list of five or six topics, the list of everybody's preferences, and you would manually go and do the assignments to all that stuff. That, that's what most people would do if they weren't you know, computer scientists or computationally oriented. A computational person, like a computer scientist, would say, I'm going to write a program to do this, and they would write a program. And to Jules's point, like trying to train something to figure out whether the beer bottle is half empty or whatnot, it's gonna take a long time to do that. So we didn't wanna to have to do any of that. So instead what we did is we used ChatGPT and I gave it a prompt. And I'm gonna switch over here in a second and show you the actual prompt to the actual session. So I said, here's input for our 35 faculty members and their top three preferences ordered from highest to lowest. Please generate output that allocates all 35 members to all five topics, balancing them out evenly, roughly seven faculty per topic, taking their ordered preferences into account. Also, please give preference to faculty in the order they responded to the poll so the people who did it later would get less preference. And then I said, here's the format, Doug Schmidt, those are what I like, that means my top preferences are topic area three, followed by five, followed by one, and then I gave a list of all the faculty members and their preferences. So what we're gonna do now, because we have a little bit of time, is we're actually gonna go look at ChatGPT and see what it did for us. So here's the output from ChatGPT, or my session of interactions with ChatGPT, one of the cool things with ChatGPT nowadays is you can go and actually export your conversation like this, and then you can do something like cut and paste it into a PowerPoint presentation so other people can come along and read this. So here's, here's the original prompt. Here was my list of faculty and their, their preferences. And what it did, this is really, really interesting. So keep in mind, the goal of this was not to write a lick of code. We're just gonna interact conversationally with ChatGPT. So it starts out by trying to figure out how to do this, and it basically came out with an allocation based on its internal algorithm. And what happened the first time around was that it didn't allocate poor Jonathan Sprinkle. Jonathan Sprinkle was a uh, come to the party late kind of guy. He was the last person to enter his choices, so he wanted two, three, or four, and because of various things having to do with greedy algorithms, it stuck him in a topic area he didn't want to be in. So I said, well, your greedy approach, you greedy algorithm system, ended up allocating Jonathan Sprinkle to a topic that he doesn't want to be in. Can you use a different algorithm that respects everybody's preferences and doesn't allocate faculty to topics they didn't express interest in? So then it starts talking about bipartite graph matching algorithms and something called the Hungarian algorithm, which I didn't know anything about, and so it, it went ahead and did all that stuff, and then it came up with a new allocation. And unfortunately this time, poor Jonathan Sprinkle <laughs> is still out in the cold. He's been voted off the island, a la Survivor. And I said, well, <laughs> thank you. Is it possible to generate a solution that assigns all faculty members and guarantees each one is assigned to one of their top three choices? So then it went back and talked about some other algorithm stuff that I was vaguely aware of and it tried, and what happened was very interesting. So it, it says, 
it seems the process got stuck in an infinite loop. So ChatGPT is self-aware enough to know it was not going to ever converge on a solution with the approach it was taking. So it said, okay, well, let's try a different approach. Let's use randomness. So it realized itself it could do random uh, shuffling of things. And what it ended up doing was ultimately generating something where finally uh, we end up with Jonathan Sprinkle getting put in something that he cares about, which is topic two. And everybody else got input in things that they were interested in. So what was so cool about this was I didn't have to write any code. And with a very short period of time, actually, we, we started this maybe at you know, 8.30 in the morning. The thing started at 9. We collected people's interest by the time they showed up. And within about 15 minutes, we had the whole thing working. No code was written. We ended up with a solution that made people happy enough to get on with the faculty meeting. And it was a great example of using these tools for problem solving as opposed to programming. So we were engaged again in a sort of a Socratic dialogue with ChatGPT. So this particular example we just walked through underscores the point that Jules had made earlier that I think is very important. In the very near future, like a couple of months ago, everybody can be a programmer, but they're not programming in the classic sense with Java or C++ or God help us JavaScript. They're programming through prompt engineering and instructing the generative AI tools, the large language models, the ChatGPTs and Geminis and Claudes how to generate what we need and how to engage in something. And what's interesting about this, there's a nice article here that you can take a look at that basically makes this point. We're democratizing programming. And so I went to ChatGPT and I said, please generate me an image that demonstrates this concept of democratization of programs where people work together with computers. And that's what it came up with. So it's also great to be able to generate visualizations of, of things that we're doing when we want to show abstract concepts. So to kind of wrap up and look ahead, and then we'll have lots and lots of time for Q&A. If you go to ChatGPT and say, what are the most significant revolutions in technology over the past 500 years? Here's what it comes up with. Printing press, I think you'll all agree that's pretty influential. Certainly led to the Protestant Revolution, if nothing else. The steam engine led to the Industrial Revolution, led to Cornelius Vanderbilt becoming the robber baron that he is and uh, making Vanderbilt possible. Electricity, not a bad thing. Uh, and then we get into the 20th century computers and the internet and web, and then generative AI and augmented intelligence. This is an extremely pivotal time in history. As Jules said, this is so exciting. It could be the time of our life. And what's so exciting about this is we have a chance to influence the way this is going to go for both good and bad. Now, what's interesting about this is there's a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, probably everybody here has heard the concept of the digital divide where there are people who have access to the internet and the web and computers and those who don't. And that's a big problem, but we're getting better because internet's becoming basically like the ground level of Maslow's hierarchy of human needs where you can't, maybe, maybe Wi-Fi and coffee are like the foundational level in Maslow's hierarchy, right? But when we think about what's happening, there are gonna be a lot of people who are AI savvy and they're going to be very, very, very productive, a thousand times more productive. I'm way more productive than I used to be a year ago. And then there'll be, unfortunately, be other people who are not AI savvy, either because they don't want to be AI savvy or they don't have an opportunity to go to an educational experience where they're taught how to be successful with these tools. And they're going to fall further and further behind very quickly. And this is a cause for concern. However, to end on an optimistic note, we are at a very interesting time in history where Anybody with a computer and 20 bucks a month, basically, what is that, three expensive spice, uh, pumpkin spice lattes at Starbucks, you know, for that about money, you can get access to this technology. You can become an expert at prompt engineering. And one of the rare opportunities in the history of humankind, there's nobody on the planet, well, very few people, who have more than six to 12 months of experience doing this kind of stuff. This is the time to do it. If you, if you, or your sons or daughters go out to become a web developer by taking an online boot camp. Even if you graduate within 24 weeks with your certificate, there's people out there with dozens of years of experience you have to compete with or they have to compete with. So it's not a level playing field. Prompt engineering, it's a level playing field. This is brand new. So all you have to do is have creativity, common sense. One of the things we find a lot is the people we work with don't have to be computer scientists. They can be doctors or lawyers or nurses or business professionals. They just have to be able to think clearly and express themselves clearly and watch Jules's videos on prompt engineering from, from Coursera and so on. 
So it's a great time to be in, involved. My advice, jump into it. It's really fun. I got my dad a ChatGPT Plus subscription for Christmas. So he's been having lots of fun playing around with that. And anybody can do it. It doesn't take much work. However, you have to be prepared to, what do they used to say for the strategic arms limitation talks, trust but verify. So you have to take a very measured, skeptical view of almost everything you get out of these things. But that's OK, because we need to be teaching our kids to do that no matter what, because everything they get from the internet is always suspect. There's a great meme out there that says, you can't trust everything you read on the internet. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> so with that, I think we're going to wrap up the discussion or the lecture part, and then we'll be happy to take any questions you have.